So, Timo Jan Jankowski, welcome to the show. Welcome, Saul. Thanks for having me here. No, pleasure. Thanks for coming all the way live from Fiji. Really excited to have you on the show, uh, Timo. Just give us a little brief uh, description of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please. I'm uh, 36 years now, but I'm quite happy, happy because uh, since uh, more or less since 11, 12 years, I can work a full time in football. And yeah, like all of us, I started playing in uh, my, my village club. And uh, from under 17, under 19, um, I played in the, in the highest youth league in Germany. And uh, from there, after I finished high school with 18, I went to New Zealand to play their football for one year. And then there I was, uh, yeah, when I look back, super lucky because I also started coaching. And um, Minton Rufer, he's quite a famous name. He's the Oceania player of the century. He had a football school in New Zealand. And there was also a former Japanese national player who was coaching there. So yeah, already with 18 years, besides playing, I started uh, coaching. And uh, yeah, after, after I stopped uh, playing in New Zealand, I traveled a little bit around and I uh, got a tropical virus. And uh, then I was out for playing. And uh, yeah, then I started a degree in uh, business management. And in hindsight, I always say for fun, the only good thing about it, it was I knew what I don't want to do. So I was very sure, yeah, I want to <laughs> go back to coaching and started my coaching license quite early. So I think with a 25 or 26, I already did my A license with the German FA. And uh, by that time already before I worked for the, for the German FA. And yeah, I'm uh, based, I was based in Germany, close to the border to Switzerland. And then the next step was uh, yeah, going to Switzerland. I was working first for... Um, for FC Aarau, uh, the first team's playing in the highest league as under 16 coach. And then for the, from there, I went to Grasshopper Zurich, the Swiss record champion, and worked uh, for almost nine years in different roles before I'm now here since, uh, yeah, now already since 10 months, I'm the technical director of the FGFA. Wow, quite incredible career only, 36 years young. So very impressive. Imagine where you're going to go in the next 36 years of coaching experiences. It's exciting. Tell me about your first role. I'm going to try and pronounce this as a Stutzpunk trainer with the German FA, your yes, first yes. coaching role. What, I thought what, it was quite an interesting one. What, tell tell us like about a, that then. Yes, Germany had a very bad European Championship in 2000. Huh? And, uh, yeah. We could not progress through the group stage. Uh, we draw against Romania and it was a very old team. In uh, 1996, they won the European title. Uh, but uh, I think they missed a little bit to integrate new players, though the German FA did a very smart thing all over Germany is a built up. I think it's at this time, it was already more than 300 so-called Stützpunkte. And the Stützpunkt is like a talent development center. So right. from one certain area, the best players from uh, eight, nine, 10 <laughs> years, they got selected and then they got trained um, in this uh, talent development center. And from there, they meet with the surrounded talent development centers. And it ends up uh, as the under 15 national team. And I was in charge uh, yeah, of, of one, uh, yeah, as I said, in Germany, but close to the border to Switzerland. And that was quite interesting uh, yeah, from a young age to, to start in a, such a role. So what, tell us, so, so you take the eight, nine, well, how, how old, 10, 11, did you say? How old were the players there at the yes. you, you start already, you know, to have a good relationship to all the clubs who, who are related to your area that you already yeah. know before, ah, there's a really talented player coming up. And then yeah. uh, from the, it was the under 10s, under 11, we, we wow. started selecting them, giving them so you, additional training. So you're taking the, all, from the pro clubs, from all the academies, so you're taking players from... I know, that's, that's, no, that's the interesting thing. Not from the pro clubs, it's from the local oh. grassroots clubs. And right. by that, we really could see when Germany won the world title in 2014, a lot of the players progressed from this level. Because everyone started as a like more or less in a grassroots club, and then from there, players most of the time got picked from the from the big youth academies. But uh, yeah, the FA wanted to make sure you know to have a bigger pyramid, and that already from yeah. a young age we are aware who are the most talented players. They get a good quality training. Also, the coaches got educated. So yeah, it was a was an interesting project, and it's it's ongoing until now. Do you think that's still the case now that you can still have? talented 10, 11 year olds that are not in the academy system in Germany that have not been identified by the pro clubs. I'm talking about England now with such a saturated market. There's so many clubs and it's like a race mm -hmm. to the youngest who can get the youngest. There's very rarely, you know, those players slip through the net because there's so many clubs, so many scouts in, in England, for example. Yes, it's the same situation in Germany. I think now the system is so good after so many years. You know, I think it's hard. Uh, of course, sometimes you have these players, maybe they join the 15, 16, but I think it becomes more and more difficult. Yeah, maybe you can speak later about it. 
you know, with all mm. the, there are a lot of studies, like at least you need eight years in a top environment to train. So I think now the system is so good in Germany that from this um, DFB Stützpunkte, so many players uh, make the way already from a young age or in the right age to a, to a pro club. So tell us a bit about that centre then, your first job. Tell us a bit about what was the coaching philosophy, the coaching methodology that you provided there with these young players? Yeah, it was uh, broke, broken down uh, from, the, from the German FA. And uh, yeah, in the German FA, I think uh, I can say I did uh, my A license. We have some very good uh, educators, some really, really smart people. Maybe they're not so famous to the outside world, but they are highly experienced in the youth development. So I think there were some, some, some groups who, who discussed how can we do that in the best possible way. And already by this time, um, a very important thing was, uh, you know, I think it's not just in the German FA. In the coach education, you have the, you have the four pillars. You say like, ah, you have a technique. Tactic, mental, yeah. athletic. But, mm. uh, you know, um, Ryman Verheyen, he identified there are six big mistakes in this, in this setup. For example, where's the game awareness, which becomes very mm. important. And I think what the time I was starting as a young coach, what was very interesting, uh, now everybody is speaking about scanning game awareness, but already at this time, and it's now quite some years ago, the German FA was very aware uh, that the space is becoming more and more tight and less. So game awareness is a very important point to develop, even if it is not mentioned in the coaching, you know, in this coaching model. So mm. a lot of things was about individual training to develop a scanning ability. And of course, also very important, another topic, uh, you know, the outplaying. Outplaying in a 1v1, uh, identifying the, the 2v1 situations. So it was uh, a lot about like uh, this small group tactics, individual tactics. So the players can reach uh, a high individual level before they progress to the, to the next stage. So I think at this time, yeah, they were a little bit ahead uh, before a lot of countries. Interesting. Can you give us an idea what a typical session might look like for some of the boys there? Yeah, like the, the interest, well, I think what they also did really good, what I enjoyed, you know, they had a very clear idea, but it was not like they were giving you the session one to one. So, for example, we also had the mentors who were coming time to time to, to watch the training, to give feedback. So we had to stick uh, to a certain topic that was changing. I think by this time it was a six-week cycle. And then we had to stick in this topic, but we could choose. Uh, we got some ideas of exercises, but depending on how quick our players progressed, yeah, we could we could choose the ones because we were the ones who see them on a, on a weekly basis. So they gave us a topic, but they also gave us the freedom. So that was also nice to see. They, they believed in us. Oh, they educated us. Of course, they want to see the topic, but they give us some freedom in between the topic, which I, when I look back, is important because I think you need to give a topic, but if you give the session one-to-one, -one, I think as a coach, you lose some, some of the drive, Absolutely. some of the session. That's so agreed. yeah, they, they basically and, and so us give, us, give us an idea, give us an idea of a topic then and give us, give us a bit of a session that you would have put on, like, you know, warm up, bit part one, yeah, part two, just, you know, some of the juicy details, as we say in England. For example, like the, let's say the, the 1v1 uh, was broken down, you know, in those different situations, uh, open and from okay. to the side on different angles, open and behind. Yeah. And then we already try to correlate it in a, in a warm up, uh, you know, maybe you can call it ball mastery with a different uh, progressions that uh, that's also, you know, we did some moves. For example, if I have an open end up front, it's a different kind of moves uh, you need to do as if you have an open end at the an angle. So we already yeah. tried to implement the moves at the beginning of the session, which are correlated to the one we one topic uh, later on. And then, yeah, we also had tried to have a progression, you know, like maybe we have a start unopposed, a lot of repetitions. Then uh, maybe we had a, a passive, a guided defending type of uh, training in the next part, in the next block. And then it was like, yeah, one we one small groups, maximum 12 players, a lot of, lot of repetitions. They are best, best with the best. Yeah, and then also, yeah, ended with a, with a small-sided game where we also try to relate to the topic. So quite a simple, uh, basic building blocks, but I think the nice thing, we really stick, stick to the topic. Yeah, interesting. Did they, have, did they ever play games like with other centres and stuff like that? Any fixtures? Yes, but also, uh, especially, you know, in Germany, Switzerland, also because of the weather, a lot of like indoor tournaments, mm. yeah, which I think is also at, from this age, nice from a de uh, development point of view. But also when we played outside against, when we were measured against the other talent development centers, it was always um, small-sided games yeah, where, we, mm -hmm. where you really want, we want to see the, the, the individual class, the individual ability of a player with a lot of repetition. Yeah. yeah, Because a lot of times I think, yeah, when you play 11 against 11, uh, too young, yeah, you just see the, the, the big guys, the very clear players, but especially the late bloomers, 
yeah, I think you you need to see them in a small sided games. Absolutely. So then tell us about your next role. You moved across the border into Switzerland. Um, you're the U16 with with uh, that club. Tell us about that. How did that come about, and and what were the challenges, and what did what did you learn through those initial experiences? Yeah, and then um, I will, we moved to I moved to Switzerland, and uh, I think still until now I think we can say Switzerland they are doing an awesome work because you now we are a small country with eight million people, but mm. uh, yeah, they also they won the under 17 World Cup, they won the under 21 European Championship, and now yeah, we are we are and on every World Cup on every European Championship, and maybe football is not even the number one. You know we have, so I think the Swiss FA they do really good uh, really good work. And yeah, it was interesting for me to to go there uh, because well, so then Timo, I Timo, also in let, 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 let me just ask, why do you think that is then? Because that's a small country, for example, you know, Austria I think is a similar sort of size, and let alone other countries. Why just why why you, you've worked there many years? Why do you think they're so successful? Is in terms of is it the recruitment? Is it, you know, why are they more successful than so many of their neighbours? I think it's different different pillars for me. You know, in the even in Germany, we are structured, but uh, Swiss people in general, they are very structured. So uh, they did a very systematical approach in coach education. I think they do a really good job. I remember by this time, even bigger nations came over to Switzerland to courses to have a look at uh, what, what they do. Uh, and it was also a lot of like, at this time already, a lot of individual work with uh, coaches. And uh, that's, of course, one pillar, very good coach education. Then the second pillar is also the talent ID. They do a very good job. I think even it's easier in Switzerland than in Germany, but I think Switzerland, they hardly miss any talent. They, I must say they do a really great job. And there's also like they do have a system where you always can come back. So maybe you're a late bloomer and maybe you, I would not say drop, but maybe you go to a club and it's planned. Maybe you go to a partner club where you get a lot of game time and then there's a high chance that you come back into the system. There are a lot of examples. That's another very yeah. smart step. And the fourth thing, I would not say it's blend, but you know, in Switzerland, we have a French speaking part. We have Italian speaking part and the German speaking part. And I think what they also do good, you know, if you play an Italian speaking part against FC Lugano, it's like Catenaccio, Italian style of football. Mm -hmm. If you go to the French part, very nice profiles, you know, like uh, the, the black guys, very fast, a lot of athleticism, a lot of individual class. In the German speaking part, very structured, very good education. And I think also this mix, because I also was uh, under, under 16 assistant coach uh, for a time. And they really could see the mix. So I think three things, the coach education, the talent ID, and the club management that we don't lose a player. So that is planned. And the fourth pillar, it's maybe not planned. It's the culture. But I think they're aware of it and they just leave it like this. So it's very nice. Mm -hmm. We have a mix of different uh, playing philosophies, football philosophies. And I think that mix is interesting. And tell us about then your that 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 first coaching job you had there, FC Aurora, Aurora. Is it? Aurora? I think it was uh, next. I think that's also important in a coaching pathway. It was the next logical step because it was an older age group under 16, and oh, yeah. it's a professional club, but it's more like I would say a smaller club with a very good uh, environment. So yeah, that was really nice for me also to progress from a personal point of view, and. Um, the uh, under 18 coach, he was the former first team coach, but uh, he enjoyed the youth more. He really had a heart for youth and also the, the head of youth, Sasa uh, Stauch, he was a player for FC Aro, where they also won the title. And oh, every day I was with uh, six, three persons in, a, in one room. So yeah, it was very nice for me from two experienced guys uh, to, to learn a lot, uh, to progress. And then I think, yeah, we did quite a good work and also, and I can well, say any... this time, if I look but it was maybe a mistake, you know, I was oh. focused too much on winning by this time. I was a very young coach. I want to show how uh, I, I can, yeah. but actually it helped me to progress to the, maybe the, the with FC Basel to the best youth environment in Switzerland to cast up a Zürich. Yeah, because we, we beat the team and then uh, they say, think, ah, uh, or they say, spoke with me if I want to move over. Yeah, but when oh, I look man. back, I was too much into winning and not development, but to change okay. the roads to progress to the next club, it was helping me. Well, you got development of your career. It's also important, maybe sometimes. Yes, and it was not right, if I'm honest. I'm still in good contact yeah. with all of the players. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, you know, when I speak with them, uh, yeah, they, they really, they enjoyed it. I always try to have a good relationship with my players. But if I look back, and I think it's with a lot of young coaches, the mistake is they mm. prioritize their own career pathway 
and uh, yeah. push the team to, to, to win. And maybe if I look back, I could have done more in terms of development. So yeah, that, that's a learning moment when I look back. But it yeah, helped we, me to, yeah, to progress. Yeah, we talk, about, we talk about this a lot on the show, actually, with all the coaches and about, you know, winning over development and the importance of it. That's interesting. But just, just what, what would you say, what was your main takeaway? Was there, was there anything you, you thought then when you went there in that experience in that two years, would you, would you, what were the main things you took on board, which maybe that was different from coaching in Germany or the main things you learned from that time? Uh, the main thing for me was, you know, I was so, it was the first time I was surrounded on a daily basis with uh, top coaches who yeah. were this time much more progressed than I. Both coaches had the bro license. And uh, yeah, and also you must tell sometimes you need a little bit of luck. And I was always lucky, I must say, everywhere I went, even the time I started very young in 18 in New Zealand, and then in the next club uh, with the German uh, with the German FA first, and then with FC Aarau, surrounded by two top people. Uh, it helped me a lot. So that was maybe the biggest change in the German FA. You know, I was more like by myself a little bit. We just have maybe monthly or quarterly meetings. But the big change was now on a daily basis. I was surrounded with a two, three top people. And there really, I really could progress. I could bounce ideas. I got feedback on my training. So that was maybe uh, from an environment point of view, the change was very, uh, was very important. So then tell us about Grasshopper Zurich, massive club. Um, yes great tradition of producing players what tell us about that then you told us how you initially got the job but what was the main things you noticed when you first went into the club uh, what were the what were the differences or the similarities between your last club or germany that sort of thing the uh, difference is you know it's a it's a swiss record champion uh, the last few years unfortunately they struggle a little bit but uh, still the people it's a very proud club with a rich tradition it's a also very old club and founded in uh, 1886 and as I said, it's a Swiss record champion and they always had the history for producing good young players. And what I felt immediately when I went there, you know, it was a, coming from a nice environment, nice learning environment into a pressure environment. For example, by that time, our, I was the under 16 coach. The under 18 coach was Johan Vogel, who played for, for PSV Eindhoven, who played for AC Milan. The under 15 coach was Ricardo Cabanas. The, he was the, the most famous captain of Grasshopper Zurich, Swiss national player. Under 21 coach Boris Miljonic, also Grasshopper Zurich captain. And you know, also me coming from Germany without a big playing career in between these people was also the next step to learn. So, coming mm. from a nice learning environment to a more pressure environment. So, but again, I must say, I was very lucky, you know, with, with these ex players. And I really learned from them, you know, from a player perspective, how, how, how the game works, also in, in the youth development, what um, abilities you must have to, to really make it. So again, yeah, coming from a nice learning environment to a high pressure environment. And again, very lucky. I, I was surrounded by these, by these top people. So tell us about then your, your just reflect then, because your, your career progression, because you pretty much worked right across the club, didn't you? So what was your next role and how did that progress? Yes, first I, I started as an under-16 coach. And uh, yeah, again, like even there, you know, it's about development, but you, they also want you to win something. So I was lucky. I was, uh, we were winning the Swiss under-16 cup. And of course, I said it's about development, but sometimes you also must be realistic. For which club do you work? What is expected yeah. of you? And uh, actually, again, it, it helped me uh, yeah, to progress in the club. So from an under 16 role coach, I went into a role, it was called by that time the head of performance. So I was in charge then as a next role from uh, under 21 all the way down to, to connect a little bit the, the, the football, the, the football ability with. Uh, you know, with the, with the performance environment, because at this time I also got interested. Um, I did my, as I said, my A license quite young, and I see the game becomes quicker and quicker. So one thing is, of course, you know, the, the game awareness, the technical ability, but also, you know, from a fitness point of view, uh, injury prevention, uh, how you develop uh, the coordination, the, the speed, uh, football fitness. And I was really studying this topic, but I, I could not find football people at this time. I just find very interesting people, you know, from track and field or from other environments, but it was not football related. And then I decided I studied by myself and then they created this new role, head of performance, where I was in charge to combine the, the football side, uh, the style of play, tactical things with the, with the fitness part, which was at this time not very, very common in, uh, in Switzerland. So, so give yeah, an idea then nice. of give us some practical examples and how that worked in terms of what, what were your roles and responsibilities and how did you... How did that, how did you put that onto the grass with the players? 
Yes, one the one thing was, of course, you know, we had a very good, uh, I think we will speak later about a very good influence in the club from a technical development point of view. And then we had this knowledge with, with these top former pro players and they were they had really good ideas how to develop game awareness. And uh, then we did some fitness isolated work, but all these pillars were not connected with each other, also our style mm -hmm. of play. And, and in that role, my main task was like to, to align everything in, in, into one. Uh, I think also in the last uh, podcast, when I listened to Zeb Jacobs, I'm discussing a lot with him. You know, at the moment you have yeah. methods, but yeah. <laughs> you have to build a methodology. And I must say at this time, we had a lot of good knowledge about different methods, but we didn't have a methodology. So yeah, maybe in other clubs, they would call it the head of methodology. So I was trying to align all the knowledge we had, the good things uh, combined with maybe some, some new knowledge. So that was, was so then, the, the biggest task. So, so like, for example, you know, what you see these days is stuff about high speed running in clubs. So, for example, yes. like different sorts of running at, and then, like, you know, example, you know, lucky enough, I work, work at Arsenal. I see people like Damachichi work and they, you know, everything's connected with the ball. Like you say, they're linking everything together. So it's game related practices rather than the old days, maybe where you, like you say, they're running. They're actually, it's like, it's, it's practices with the ball and game related to try and link it all together. So that I assume that's what you're talking about, right? Yes, exactly. I think that's a good, uh, a simple, a good example. You know, the max speed, Yeah. you know, you can ask, and actually it's, a, I don't know, I also tried a little bit to see what happens on the pitch, football as a starting point, but then also try to prove it with uh, maybe science or objective facts. And I think if you say the definition of speed in football, you, are, you, you know, you have to be on time. But uh, you also today, a lot of players have a good game awareness, they are on time. And then the next step is you have to be also very fast. And it's called the Kohler effect. So, for example, I, and it's a very nice metaphor also from Raymond Verheyen. For example, I tell you, or he would say you, it's his metaphor, you sprint 30 meters as fast as you can, but isolated. And you promise me you go as fast as you can. And then I give you enough recovery time. And then you sprint again, but a hungry lion is following you. Where do you think you're faster? Mm -hmm. Of course, it's the, the hungry lion. And that's yeah. a simple thing. Before, we did a lot of isolated sprinting, but by definition, we never reached max speed. So you just reach a max speed, you know, and you also can prove it with GPS in a, in a football action, in a high pressure one v one situation where someone is really hunting you. So that's maybe yeah. a simple example. Before, we did it isolated. Yeah, now we try to combine it in an exercise where we have uh, our one v one knowledge, where we have the max speed, where we have this scientific approach with the cooler effect. So yeah, I tried to find a lot of examples like this because I also needed to work smart to convince all these good people. And what about, what did that look like at the youngest age groups, like in the foundation phase, for example, eights to elevens? Yeah, we were also were thinking a, a, lot of, a lot about that. I think the first starting point is also, you know, to understand the footballer, you have to understand the human being. And to understand a human being, you also need to understand, you know, how, how the whole, maybe it sounds a little bit extreme, how the whole world works. And that's also the, from Victor Frade, from tactical prioritization the approach. And I think what is, if you want to find a very good objective fact or a principle or like a part of your methodology, it has to be true for under eight, but also for the first team. But of course, you know, in this uh, approach, you maybe you can adapt, adapt a little bit. But what I was just mentioning with the Kohler effect, it's also true for the under eight players. You just have to create, you know, maybe it's the same type of thinking, the, the same type of exercise, but you adjust it a little bit for under eight. And I think that these are the really strong, maybe build training building blocks, which are true for a professional player, but also for the under eight. But of course you need to have the, the age group specialists who can, who can adapt it to the, to the specific age. So we try to use the same principle, the same guidelines, but yeah, we try to work a lot with age group specialists who, who are able or have the ability to adapt to this specific age group. Interesting. And so how long did you do that role for the head of performance? Um, actually, I, I, uh, after quite a quick time, I did this role. I continued this role. But then in the first team, they were fighting relegation. And uh, then together with another guy, Carlos Berniger, who was the head coach, they asked me to help out. Yeah, to, uh, because uh, yeah, if we would have went down, it would be a big catastrophe for the club. So they asked me to to join the first team um, together with Carlos Carlos Berniger, and uh, that was the next uh, pathway uh, in in my career. Yeah, working with first team players, and uh, we could avoid the relegation, so it was successful. Um, and it was nice for me to see that the principles, the things we are working in, in the youth, 
also working in a in a first team uh, environment. So yeah, that was quite important for me to see what we do in the youth development in different age groups. This approach also works in a in a pressure environment situation with uh, professional players from uh, all kind of countries. Interesting. And so, what was the, what were the main challenges working with first team players? Yeah, the, the first thing is you know it's about it's more about the how. It's I think in general you know you can have the best knowledge, you can do the best training if you don't find a connection with the players. We must be honest. <laughs> no chance they kill you. As, you know maybe it's easier in the use. But in the first team, especially again, as a, if you don't have a big playing career, you're a young mm. guy. If you don't come well enough, they don't respect you. Uh, it will be difficult. So I give you one example. For example, um, Munas Dabur uh, was playing for us at this time, and we know we needed him in a top shape because he was maybe the only top striker by that time. And <laughs> later on, he played for FC Sevilla. He plays now for TSG Hoffenheim in the Bundesliga. So he's a he's a very good player. And when he came from Salzburg, he had some problems with the hamstring. So, you know, when I spoke to him, like, uh, I, you know, I, and I remember he was coming in with the, how do you call it? You know, not with the running shoes. He was coming with the, the busing, the busing shoes, you know. And busing a shoes. lot of coaches would act it like, well, how do you call it? You know, the, if you go to the beach, like the flip-flops. Oh, like, yeah, flip <laughs> yes. And he was coming like that to the first training, you know. Yeah, And if you're not, you know, and I, I'm lucky because the coach told me, ah, you have to build a good relationship. And for example, a mistake a lot of young coaches maybe would do, they would say, hey, how is it possible? I do a training with you and you're not wearing even running shoes. And, yeah. you know, if you do that, the, the player kills you because he goes back in the dressing room and says, hey, the young guy, what do you, what do you just think he is? But I yeah, said yeah. to him, hey, look, Munash, I really studied your, your injury uh, thing and... Yeah, I want to I wanna work with you. I want to help you. But it would be important, especially if with hamstring, if you would put your running shoes on. And he said, hey, brother, no problem. Uh, I go down. And, mm -hmm. you know, but for example, if it would react a different, he, yeah, he could yeah. kill you. And yeah, I, I saw it. I saw it also happen with other persons. So the most important thing is you need, but I think it's the same with the youth players, but even more important with professional players, you need to respect them. And then they will respect you. But if you act like the big guy, no chance. You can have the better, the best knowledge. No chance. They kill you. Hmm. So how long did you do that for? Then you just did it at the end of the season to until they were safe. Um, I did it until the end of the season for three months, so we avoided relegation. But already before I said I, I do this to help, but uh, I want to progress in the in the in the first team. But then the next step, it was nice because they could see also uh, yeah I helped the first team. It was working the way I was working, and then they gave me the head of use. The head of youth and the player development. So that's so, your head, academy director. Essentially, you're yes, the exactly. head of the academy, right? So exactly. tell us then about so, then tell us a bit about the the coaching philosophy then at the club. For example, starting at the youngest age groups with the nines, tens, elevens. What's the philosophy there in terms of technical, tactical development, that sort of thing? Yes, I think um, we always grass of Zurich always had a big tradition. You know, when they won the when Swiss won the under seventeen World Cup. Four or five players came from the Grasshoppers Academy. And also we were famous, always very young players. They have a high individual class and can go to the first team. And I think when we look back, and at, at this time it was already some years ago, but everybody spoke so highly about Ricardo Moniz and Pete Hamburg. You know, they really implemented this curve or curve method, uh, but the, you know, the curve method of wheel curve uh, yeah. in, a, in a very exactly. strong way. And even the coaches, and the players in the first team, everybody was, everyone was speaking about that, how, how strong, how good it was. So that was always part of our identity. So, of course, uh, I, I, I also wanted to reinforce it because it got a little bit lost. So we wanted to reinforce on that. But also, as again, it's a very strong method, a very unique top method to develop players individually. But we, again, in my new role, I tried to mix it in a good way, to find a good methodology. So to stick with this uh, curve, Bill Curver, Ricardo Moniz, Pete Hamburg's his strong ability to make it even stronger again, but also, you know, to mix it with a tactical periodization with, maybe you've heard about differential learning from Professor Schöllhorn. He's a professor in Mainz. It's a very, it's, it's a very nice approach. And Tuchel and Klopp, they both have been coached in Mainz and they kind of used his way of thinking in their training, which was very new. So I really went around from club to club, uh, tried to meet with smart people to learn from many different methods and trying to build our unique Grasshopper Zürich methodology. So yeah, the first thing I was researching, speaking with many people, 
with people from the past, from the successful period, to to develop our own our own methodology, and that was written down in a in a curriculum. Give us some idea then about differential learning, just so people haven't heard about it before. It's a, it's it's really it's it's really great. It's a, maybe I must say he's ten years ahead. If you really listen to him at the beginning, you know it sounds crazy. So for example, what he's saying, or like he said, his study has proven it that we only learn from from the different from the differentiation between things. So even if you work, for example, with the with the cover method, where it's a lot about repetition, he said the only thing you learn is from the difference between the two repetitions, because he, he has proven it's impossible. Uh, he said if you want to, sh you shoot from 60 meters to goal, and you want to repeat the same shot, it will cost you 10, 30, 50 thousand shots, and it's not possible in one football lifetime. But still, you want to repeat the situation. But the only thing you learn from is to differentiate between the shots. And for example, what he's suggesting, and uh, it sounds crazy, but now I'm testing it here in Fiji and it, it seems to work really well. So for example, you shoot a free kick in a, in a, in a, with maybe you with the perfect technique, what he's saying, it's not existing. And then maybe the next time you swing your right arms and you try to shoot. And then the third time, Maybe you start to jump only on your left leg before you kick it with your right foot. And then maybe after 100 uh, different repetitions, then you shoot again. And what he's saying, with this extreme difference doing the same thing, the, the, the first shot and the last become even better. So it's a new way of, of thinking. And yeah, it's, a, it's, it's maybe I met him once. And when I met him, unfortunately, at this time, I was not good enough. I could not challenge him enough, you know, with questions. But this guy is so inspiring. You know, he's a, he studied physics, he studied the brain. But on mm -hmm. the other end, also he studied Zen Buddhism. So again, it's, it's a methodology, you know? A lot of people, they just stick like religion. They say, ah, I am a Christian, I am a Muslim. And I cannot even listen what the good things, the other things, uh, the other people do. But he studied the one extreme, he studied the brain, the physics, and then he studied the Zen Buddhism. And he looked in between what it is possible. And yeah, maybe uh, his, uh, maybe you should try to get him on the podcast. He can explain much better. It's yeah, well, <laughs> really Absolutely. fantastic. And so I must say. And before you go on to that, and, and you, you talked about, you said about Cobra and you said Will Cobra and Ricardo Cobra, because we tried to explain this on the show and people who I've been lucky enough to work with Ricardo and people don't necessarily understand the difference, do they, between the different maybe because... Cobra is a, is, a, is a broad church, like a broad umbrella of many different, you know, aspects underneath it. Tell us what's your thinking of that? What's, what's so special about that particular style? That, yeah. Because people say Cobra is everything. People say I'm Cobra, so actually, no, my Cobra is a bit different from maybe what is commonly known as Cobra, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, it started like this, like when I went to Switzerland and for the first club I worked and we played events against grasshoppers, I still could see, wow, the, the quality, the one we won, the individual quality they had. And I got interesting, I think, what are they doing? How do they work? And then, you know, I spoke with people and then I found out they say, ah, it's from this time from Pete Hamburg and Ricardo Moniz. It's still, even there are some years gone, imagine how strong this, this method must, must be. It was in 2010, 11, I think, and Ricardo Moniz left Grasshoppers in 2005, six, and even six years later, without the person still being in the club, they're still speaking about him and saying it was his way of thinking and together with Pete Hamburg. And then um, in 2012, Ricardo Moniz was the coach at Ferenc Varos Budapest. And uh, I was playing in New Zealand with a former um, Hungarian youth national player and he working now for the Federation. And I called him and I said, hey, I must meet this guy. And then he arranged it that I can have a look for three days how he's working with Ferenc Varos Budapest. And I must say, it was impressive. You know, with first team players, and again, it was first the how, how he did it, the the energy he put on the pitch. You know, he he was he was already I think more than fifty years, but he was so fit. He he was really a role model. He demonstrated everything, the the energy he gave on the on the pitch. It was really impressive to me. And then I was also very happy, you know, that after this experience, I could move to this club to Grasshopper Zurich, and uh, learn learn more about it. And then the nice thing was. One year later, Carlos Bernegger, who he, he they got him back because he worked closely together with him. So he knew very well the method. And they took him back to reinforce this kind of work. And Carlos Bernegger, he became our head coach in the first team. So I went with an assistant to him into the first team. 
Mm. So then he again, he could tell me even more about this method. And I could see after Carlos Berniger was helping us six years, seven years later to work in the same style, how quick our players progressed with, uh, with this method. And, um, you know, then I also was, was, I even have it here, you know, I cannot take many books to Fiji with me, but I, I have the, the original Corvo books. And everyone who's studying it, I think the big difference is it's not just about ball mastery. Ball mastery is an important part, but this method, you know, all the positioning games to develop uh, the game awareness, even if you look at the last 20 pages, how to develop sprint capacity. And that was by, I think in the 1780s, I think this guy was really many years ahead. So it's yeah. not just the ball mastery, what everyone thinks, it's a complete, uh, complete methodology. But at the moment, I think a lot of people think, ah, Curva is just a ball mastery. And don't get yeah. me wrong, ball mastery, I think it's, it's important. But that's a whole methodology. And I really can mm. say, yeah, if you want to progress, you're working with young players, get into this real Curva, real Curva methodology. Yeah, and I, it's just what, and and it's my own and eyes. And it's the ball mastery linked to the 1v1, which is important, which is linked to the game, right? That's just, you know, which is so Yes, exactly. And you know how they linked it? It's so smart. It's so mm. smart, you know? A lot of clubs, they do ball mastery and then they train 1v1 and then they say, ah, oh, it's not working. Yeah. But you know, the steps the Ricardo Moniz implemented and Will Curva, the steps in between, you know, to go from maybe just defend, to defend uh, as guided defense. And then the next step, now you're just allowed to defend the line. Then you're yeah. just allowed to defend the space. And then you have the real 1v1. This progression, you know, also with the, how they, the, they design the field. It's so yeah. intelligent. It's so smart. If a player starts young, I think a player can, it's, 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 he, the player can progress to a high level with this methodology for sure. What do you think then? Because you mentioned Raymond Verheilen earlier. He's, you can tell he's not a fan of Kova or not a fan of any un isolated work no, I, away from the game. I think it's the same thing, you know. Raymond Verheilen, I, I did a lot of courses with him. For me, he's the most important, most intelligent football thinker. And, you know, in his role, he needs to be very critical because he wants to trigger our thinking. And as, as I said, you know, this Kerbo method, it has his parts. And I think even, even Raymond Verheyen would agree. But the Will Kerbo, I think it's a method. And what Raymond Verheyen is also speaking about, I think it's a whole methodology. And I wouldn't say that he's not a fan of it. Maybe he's thinking, you know, um, if you do maybe too much isolated training, I think he's saying it should be the exception of the rule. And I think we can agree. Let's say if you have a fantastic player, you know, maybe a Brazilian guy from, who plays all day on the beach, you know, the juggling, yeah. then directly, I think it would be a waste of time if you only play with him real football actions. But he's also saying, if you have problem with it, then of course you need maybe to go even one step back. So I think a lot of people also get Ryman for high and very wrong. I, well, I, saw him at, uh, I saw him at, I saw him at the, the conference in, in, in America once and watched his session on developing technique and it was just doing rondos and I was just like that's not I mean and, and I mean and maybe that's maybe that's me just seeing what he's you know he's obviously mm -hmm. just you know he's very he's not he's not back he's not backwards in going forwards if you say in England you know he said he speaks his mind but he just attacks people so you know oh this is that he's just doing you know circus performing that and I've seen this on, on uh so whether he believes that or not what he, he comes across is that everything's got to be within a you know opposed environment or that know, sort of thing so and you know you know yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you know, he does it with Maybe. a purpose. I really must yeah. say, like, it's again, like, we have to be very open, a gross mindset, you know. And a lot of people, he what, what he wants, he wants to trigger your thinking. It sounds extreme, but by the way he's doing it, and he even triggered you because you know, you're saying, ah, he, he did, he said this, and he said he wants to trigger your thinking. If you have a to test, if you have a strong brain, so he's provocating on purpose. It sounds a little bit extreme, but if you go yeah. into his courses, I must say the content it's it's high class. And to give it to you to give you an example, he he is always building references. So for example, he's what what he will how he would do it. He he would ask you, how does every football action starts, and then we can say okay, we watch a video, we watch Ronaldo in the Champions League, and we watch an under eight game. And then what we would see, every football action starts with communication. And communication can be verbal or nonverbal. It's better it's nonverbal, you know, we have to communicate. That's the starting point of any football action. And then the next step is, now you, you, you make a decision. Now I pass, now I press, now I shoot. 
and now I execute the decision, you know? And it is like that. And what he's saying, the communication is on the highest level. It's tactic, the next level, decision-making, you know, we can call it game insight. And the third level, executing of a decision, it's a technique. So I think even for Curver, we can take this reference, but maybe when you start from a young age, you still have to be aware we want to coach co uh, football actions, but you you have you you put a focus on the technique. But you know, even when we say I want to have the one v one frontal on the side on the angle, it's the same thinking. We start to think what happens in the game. Yeah, so I, think again, I mean that's I mean that's that's our practice design has got to be linked to well, I wanted to make it look as close to the game as possible. But even yes, then, when that, I'm working well, individually with the ball, that's the same as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think then we can agree. You know, if we would have a player from the, like, let's make example, the Brazilian guys, you know, who, are, who have so many repetitions. And if they yeah. already have a high level of ball mastery, yeah. then of course it would be a waste of time. That's the only thing he is saying, but he's saying it to trigger the coaches. But I think again, I can just speak for myself, learning from him, he's a top intelligent guy, learning from the wheel curve method, learning from tactical periodization, mm -hmm. learning from differential learning. You know, it's different methods. And I try now for Fiji, with this study the external factors, I'm trying to put from the best of this thinking my own methodology for this external environment. And that's what Raymond Fahin is also saying. Be open-minded, try to learn, but try to put it put it in references because you need yeah, references I mean, to teach the people. Yeah, but so yeah, we'll yeah, really like, um, the more open we yeah. are, the more we can learn. Absolutely. I think Rennie, Rennie Millenstein had on him on the show, who was obviously another uh, big uh, advocate of Will Cover's COVID work. And he said the same thing. He goes, give me, give me that Will Cover's work and then give me the Guardiola, you know, possession work, put those together and you've got the perfect player development model and that way. So you have that, you know, you, and that's what it's about. It's about balance, isn't it? I think we probably exactly. think you know, people want it, everything, you know, everyone's, it's binary. I'm all this way, I'm all that way. We will know anyone who really knows about you know, elite environments as you worked in is that you know you do a bit of this you do a bit of that you find a perfect mix some players need more some players need less but you have to find that you know mix and it's not it's never one or the other yes to totally agree you know and you also can say you know a little bit philosoph philosophical you know dual yeah. like the, the whole world is dual yeah. you know, we only know what war is because we know what peace is yeah. you breathe in you breathe out you have day you have night so one thing can only be true with its, with its opposite. But I think in football, you know, a lot of people, they act like, ah, I'm a cover guy. I'm a Raymond Fahey and I follow this. But I think we need to be open. We need to learn from, from everyone. We need to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be, you know, more positive in football to, to inspire us, to inspire each other. Because at the end of the day, we all have the same aim to learn, to become better coach, to, uh, to do better training, to get a better player. So I think that's very important because the whole world is dual. Absolutely. And so back to, let's not get to go on a bit of a tangent there. So tell me again about so the younger age group. You, you've, you've gone for this mix of COBRA and, and game understanding. So give us an idea of what's some of the sort of practices you're using, or the, 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 you know, practice design that you're going to be um, putting on for the boys. What we try to do, for example, like, uh, you know, when the players, sometimes, you know, they are all not, maybe the training starts at five o'clock, but some players are already there half an hour before. So mm -hmm. we always try to say, no, maybe two players on the pitch and we just started to play one v one next player come two v one you know and we did a little bit of this until everyone was there and then of course in the younger age group we try we, we implemented this ball mastery program already linked to the next building blocks and uh, yes yeah, there we already you, you know we want to have a emphasis on being both footed a lot of different you know turns movements in a very structured way also, the, the topic, uh, we called it ball control. That's all the techniques in the, in the air. And uh, then in, 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 and always short building blocks because the attention span is not long in this age group. I think that's also mm -hmm. part of the differential learning. Yeah, always new, new input, uh, change, change quick, like repetition without repetition. I think that's how maybe Professor Shalon uh, would, would call it. So, and you talked about you talked about the skills and turns in a structured way. So what does that mean? Did you have like a, a curriculum say, right, guys, these are the skills we want the boys to know. Teach them however you want, but it's like almost like you know a, a curriculum of the, the, the different skills and techniques you wanted the players to have. Yes, it was very clear defined. You know, we had to, we said okay, there are for us in our way of thinking is that there are four different situations in one v one, one v one frontal, 
and it's not the most common one, but I think that's what player loves the most. Yeah. So we start because, you know, from a player perspective, maybe I think the most situation is having an open end from a, at the back or at the angle. So maybe yeah. it would be also logic because it, it occurs more often, often that we start with that. But we said, no, it's player centered. They love 1v1 frontal. So we had moves correlated to the different 1v1 situations. And it was between four to six moves, different, you know, how you can outplay open end correlated to the four different situations. And it was also connected, you know, with the receiving, different receiving patterns. And uh, then we had the progression, as I was mentioned, in the 1v1, you know, from, from simple to, to difficult, from, uh, from slow to fast, uh, from uh, maybe unopposed to opposed. But sometimes maybe we changed it the other way around. If we had a feeling the last training, it was very nice, progressed. Then maybe we started directly opposed. So it's also part of the differential learning. Always new, you know, stick with the topic, have a clear idea how your player lo should look like, your, your style of play, but then be flexible in the method. You know, feel the, feel the player. It was also interesting correlated to this topic. I was speaking once, uh, I had a nice opportunity to have a dinner with Albert Capellas, who's now the head oh, of right. news in Barcelona. Yeah, I know. A Albert very great well. guy. And, you know, he was, yeah. ask, he was asking me, uh, like, when is the best way to blend the training? You know, it was a little bit provocating question. And, you know, I was thinking, ah, uh, I, was, I was explaining, ah, uh, you know, you have a long-term plan, a weekly plan. I have to reflect on the training yesterday. And he said, yeah, yeah, all right. But the best moment to plan a training is the moment you see the players. Because, you know, the players, they are individuals and they go to school, they have maybe some problems. So you, you need to feel, you have to develop a feeling what's needed today. But you have to be very well organized because if you want to feel and to react, you have to have in your head, in your head all the progressions, all the exercises. So, for example, you know, when I was seeing the players, I looked, I looked down on the pitch and they were playing long balls for whatever reason. And maybe I know some players, they had a hard time in school, they had a hard test. Then we were maybe saying, okay, see six players, play three with three who had a hard test and just enjoy today. Three with mm. three, enjoy yourself. But with the other players who played the long balls, for whatever reason, you need to have exercise. So maybe, you know, you did a positioning game where you need to switch with a switch play, where you had this long ball. Because the players kind of showed you what they wanted to do. So I think you need to have a clear plan, how to play, how, what kind of player you want to develop. But then it was very nice what Albert Capellas was saying. You need to smell the situation. You need to smell the football. But you have to be so good that you can react very intuitive and quickly. So I, I really like that. That really stick with me already. This dinner is some years ago, but I still have this thinking. It's, it's very nice, I think. Yeah, yeah I know. Albert, I, better, I had Albert on the show and I also interviewed him. I know Albert, you know, I met him, was at a conference with him as well. And he always talked about Superman theory they have at Barcelona where, you know, high speed, small spaces, you challenge the player, everything's done, you know. And I always sort of pulled that into my individual work, you know, same thing, you know, ball mastery and 1v1, the tight spaces. So players, you know, are like Supermen on the ball. So, yeah, a real, a real top, top guy, Albert, and fantastic influence. So just before we go, let's move on then to Fiji. Tell us about that then. You, you know, you, you obviously, I mean, this could be worse places in the world to... Uh, to live. Tell us how that how did that opportunity come about and what was the decision making process around that leaving Grasshopper Zurich as real top academy in Europe to go across the world into Fiji? As I said, I was working almost at the end nine years with Grasshopper Zurich. And you know, it was um, for the whole club, it was a difficult period because as I said, we used to be the Swiss record champion and the expectation were higher, but we also the club struggled a little bit financially. But still, I think from uh, my the development point of view, we did a good job. Because I think in this eight, nine years, we, are, we developed more than 60 players, you know, who we scouted from a young age, who progressed into professional football. So with that, I, I created a little bit of a name for myself. So, yeah, I had different, different opportunities already the years before. Uh, for example, yeah, I also had a, in, the, in the Middle East a financial, very attractive opportunity. But the longer it went, you know, and then with this COVID situation, I had a, I had a long time to think. Okay, also, you know, what is important for me? And I think also coaches should do that more. Because also in these eight years, I experienced 10 different first team professional coaches. And, you know, we, love, we all love football. But I think to have a successful life, you need to combine, you know, you need to be good with your family, with your friends. You need to be healthy, a healthy brain, a healthy body. You need to have other things outside of football. If you really want to be performed top in football, 
And I was thinking a lot about this, you know, also analyzing all these top coaches. And I asked myself, how, what would I do? What, what do I want to be and do in the future? What kind of persons, person do I want to develop in? And by that time, you know, I have three little daughters. And I was thinking, okay, uh, I want to combine this. I want to learn uh, a new environment, new culture, but I still want to be in football. And what I also find out, I love, develop something. I want to be in a long-term project. And in this head of youth, it's a higher chance to be in a long-term role. And uh, as, as, for example, as a first team coach or first team assistant, and I was then thinking, okay, maybe as a technical director of a federation, you can work even more long-term. And, you know, then the, the, the FIFA is based in Zurich. So the, the whole time, like I had some contacts with a FIFA and I met some people, uh, I studied some people who work in this role, but not just football wise, also from a personal point of view, what kind of persons are these? And these persons are were really inspiring, you know, they all, they all, they could combine it in a very good way. They have a high knowledge about football, uh, but they had a very good time with the family. These guys, they looked very healthy. Uh, they enjoyed the life. They're very happy people. And then I was thinking more and more about that. And the first thing I wanted to do, actually, I was, I wanted to work for uh, FA in Africa. It would have been an awesome project. You know, um, it, it, it would have been a big country with a lot of million people, but almost no football development. And everything was already blend. And then, unfortunately, COVID hit us really hard. And this country, uh, you know, I could not go there anymore with my family because it was, it went almost more or less in a civil war, unfortunately. So that was the first idea. I wanted to go there. And then this Fiji opportunity came up because as I said, I was playing in New Zealand and we also had some national players in my team, you know, from Solomon Islands, from other countries. I already visited Fiji at this time. And then I found out, say, looking for a technical director. And uh, the national coach, a fantastic guy we have here, a Danish guy, 74 years, very experienced. I had a very good meetings with him. Uh, with the FA, very well organized FA, uh, very good strategic plan. And of course, I already know Fiji and, you know, it's uh, the, the whole combination was almost too good to be true. Very nice, beautiful country, very well organized FA, uh, a great national coach, a long, long term contract. And I said, yes, let's let's go. Let's go into a new adventure. So tell us a bit about the, what's the football landscape like then in Fiji? Um, you know, it's a... Uh, it's not well developed by, uh, from a youth development point of view, because, you know, we're also a little bit isolated from the rest of the world. So before I came here 10 months ago, we, had a, we only had the under 19 and under 16 league, but that just started one year ago. So there were no reference points for youth development. But uh, if I look at the talents, you know, I'm here based in the West in Bar. And uh, I started immediately, you know, to find some, to get some players together. And I can tell, and I hope we get the opportunity to do though, the natural movement talent, it's so strong. These players are mm. such quick learners. And I already must say after wow. 10 months, my group I train here, the under 11th, under 12th, under 13, we can compete in Europe. Because wow. they are such, you know, the, in Europe, we need to do a lot of coordination work. Yeah. But yeah. here, you know, we do everything barefoot because they don't have shoes here. That's another very interesting thing when I studied the football landscape, you know. They in Fiji, they were saying, ah, we don't have boots. It's very hot here. You know, and I turned it around. I said to my players, hey, imagine if we can run in this heat, in this humidity. Imagine if we play in the West, in the Western world, how easy it is. And I say, hey, imagine by the time when you're 16, 17, you play for the under 16 national team and you have boots, you fly. So I tried to turn it around. But I also was studying, you know, it was new for me. Uh, for example, this barefoot thing. In Fiji, we, when, when I drive around, you, you hardly have goals. You know, they are very nice players, like a nice profile. But if you don't have goals, you know, the direction is missing. And one of yeah. the most beautiful things is scoring goals. So they also yeah. were not experienced that. So a lot of in my thinking now is, yeah, we need to have goals in every session. Uh, we play barefoot. And I also, I, I, I coach barefoot. And I feel by myself, you know, especially in this ball mastery, how much I progress. Because, you know, yeah. barefoot, if you don't hit it perfect, and it's also a way of differential learning, instead of saying, coaching the whole time, ah, you have to strike like this, with the inspan, with the, with the outside, it is like this, just play barefoot, you find out very quick for yourself, because you only hit once in the ground, and then you know how you need to shoot. And then I was studying a method of a guy, he's called Jean-Marc Yu, 
I don't know if you heard about him. He's maybe the top guy in the world for developing players a lot of people never heard of. It's a French guy and he, it's a former French national player. And it's interesting when he coached also in the highest league in French and Arsene Wenger started his career as an assistant of this guy, Jean-Marc Yu. Yeah. And then the show, this guy, Jean-Marc Yu, you know, he had a heart for youth development. And he I heard went to he went to, I've heard of him. Yeah, I have heard of this guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. And, you know, it's fantastic. In, he worked in uh, Abidjan and he started with an under 12, under 13 year old. And this group, they were more or less under 19 group. Imagine they won the African championship. And when Ivory Coast qualified for the World Cup and won the Africa Cup, 70, 80% mm -hmm. of the players are from this, from this academy. And now Mali is very strong. You know, all the players playing in Liverpool, Salzburg, the under-17s, mm. they went to the semi-final. It's also from his academy. And I think, his I think the, uh, the uh, Yaya Torre and uh, yes, exactly. Torre. Yes, all these great yeah, players. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and they all play yeah. barefoot. So yeah. I was studying this. You know, there are some video clips. I, I maybe mm. can send you one later after the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what he's doing? Crazy things. You need to chuggle right outside, left outside, over your head. And yeah. just do it with pro, with pro players. They will struggle, I can tell you. But what he's doing, you have to do that on time. So you have to go barefoot, this difficult skill, and then maybe in 100 meters, you have to do that in 20 seconds. So yeah. always competition. And I studied this method because, you know, this environment in Fiji, I didn't have a reference point. And then again, mm -hmm. I did the same. I am very open. I try to learn. And I implement this, you know, with all the mix, with uh, the thinking of Ryman Fahayan with the thinking of Will Curver, with the thinking of differential learning, now with the thinking of Sean Mark Yu, I try to get the best out to develop now our own unique curriculum. And actually in two weeks, we launched the curriculum here in Fiji. So that will be also totally new. And I think, uh, yeah, with that, I hope we will very progress because people lack, lack reference thinking. And now I hope mm. uh, to this, this, with this use curriculum, and you know, it's not my curriculum, I just, I speak with a lot of Fijian people. I try to develop it together with them. And actually we have a very nice name in Fijian. We call it Totolo Futopolo. And you know, that's also nice. It sounds like total football, but mm. actually if you translate it, it means fast football because we have a lot of fast players. You know, the fast muscle fibers, we really have mm. it here, but also they are fast from a thinking point of view. You know, for example, I come from Switzerland. If my three daughters go over the street, it's very easy. You know, we're over-organized in Germany and Switzerland. You maybe, yeah. you don't even have to look to the left. You just go over the street, everyone stops because everyone sticks to the 30 kilometers. But if you want to go here in Fiji over the street, you know, car coming from one side, we have the wild ducks coming, then one car crossing from the other side, people running over the street. What they do, you know, they scan, 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 decision-making, decision-making. Yeah. And that was my analysis when I came here. A lot of fast muscle fibers, very nice developed nervous system. And this, maybe not football related, but this scanning, this quick thinking learning, it's really in here. And I think it's a fantastic starting point. I really look forward to develop something in the next few years. And what, what's your target then? How are you going to gauge your success at, in, in Fiji? Yes, you know, um, it's, it's different roles. You know, I'm in charge of the coach education. That's very important. I'm also in charge you know, of the national teams, women, men, youth national teams. Then another pillar is also beach soccer, futsal. But my main task, why I'm here, and it's called, it's new from FIFA, a new project from Arsene Wenger. It's called the Talent Development Scheme. And uh, on the second, on the presentation of this Talent Development Scheme, of the second slide, it says, every talent deserves a chance. And that's my main target here. And together with this Talent Development Scheme, what we want to do until 2026, all over Fiji, we want to build 20 to 25 talent development centers, you know, like we did in Germany. So that's my mm. main target. And I'm, if I think if I could do this together with the people here in the next four years, having no references for youth development, and in four years, we will end up with this 25 talent development centers working with the same methodology, you know, same ideas of scouting, uh, that would be, uh, would be fantastic. And my aim is, um, you know, I find out I'm based here in the West, the city is called Bar. And the next biggest city is Lautoka. And it's 45 minutes away. And, you know, with the school, the school finished here at uh, four, four o'clock, but it gets dark by 5.30, by six o'clock. And we don't have the lights, you know. So already if you're 45 minutes away, you cannot train here in Bar. 
And my aim is every talent development center has to be within of half an hour. And I hope with that, every talent in Fiji by 2026 will have the chance to, to participate in a good uh, football environment, positive environment with a good methodology. That's, that's my biggest aim I want to develop in the next four years. Wow. And what was your, like, finally, what would your one bit of advice be for a young aspiring coach who would have an amazing career in the game like yourself? Most important thing for me now is uh, respect. You know, re respect the game, respect the players, and also respect other coaches, different ways of thinking, be open. You know, I did the same mistake when I was young. You know, I progressed quick in my career, and then everyone has an ego. But it's not about ego in football. It's about the player, football development, player development. So I really would advise, be very open-minded, be very positive, listen, listen to, to everyone. Um, but also develop your own way of thinking. Don't copy-paste. A lot of uh, coaches just copy-paste. Be critical in a positive way and surround yourself with better people. You know, my neighbor is uh, our national coach. He's 74. He was the, when Dennis won the European title, he was the assistant. He was the under-21 coach. He coached in Nigeria and Armenia. When I heard this, I said, I have to go there. I have a nice country, nice project, but my neighbor is much smarter, more experienced than I. And every, every day I can learn, I can learn from him and all the other people here in Fiji. So that's most important advice. Be open, be positive and yeah, learn. You can learn from everyone. Timo, thanks very much, mate. It's been fantastic. Thanks all. Nice. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.